Uh, hi everyone, um, I'm Alexander Botev. I'm currently a PhD student at University College London uh, and I'm doing here an internship in the robotics team for investigating model-based reinforcement learning for continuous control. Um, so I'm gonna chime in some of the things that Sadika earlier mentioned on model-based control. Um, so let's dive in. Um, so this is the outline of the talk um, and so Let's start. First, I'm going to introduce why we care about model-based RL. Um, so I have a small intro. I guess most of you are going to be familiar, but in reinforcement learning, we have an agent that interacts with an environment, which is different than standard supervised or unsupervised learning settings. And the way that the agent interacts is through actions, and the environment gives you back observations and a reward signal. The agents try to maximize the cumulative sum of the rewards over the episodes that he experienced. Now, the main difference between a model-free algorithm and a model-based algorithm is that model-free algorithms try to learn a policy pi and most often either uh, a value function or an action state value function which try to estimate how good a particular state in the environment are for the agent to be in. Um, and this is done solely through using the reward signal and the experience with the environment. While in model-based RL, we try to learn additionally an internal dynamics model, which essentially to models how does the environment evolve. Um, and it tries to match what you experience through the environment. And in general, we assume that we don't have access to the environment of how it works except through sampling. Um, so what are the potential benefits of actually using an internal model at all? Um, so to some extent, the kind of grail that you would have if you have a perfect and ideal model is that we can solve any task without ever interacting with the environment. So if you have a perfect model, you can simulate it as much as you want without interacting with the true environment and you can solve any task. Maybe that solving that task might be hard, uh, but that's kind of a concern that we won't consider too much. Um, so however, in practice, we have to learn this model. Um, so one of the benefits is you, first your task independent. So all of the policies and value functions that a model free algorithm estimates are based on specific rewards. So if you slightly change your task, it means that usually you have to retrain from scratch. If you have a model that's very accurately learned on one task and you change the reward, you can retrain your model free algorithm or do any kind of other search based on top of it without interacting with the environment. Um, it's usually trained in a supervised way, sometimes in unsupervised, but the benefit of this is that it's much easier to train, much more stable as these techniques don't rely on things like bootstrapping, which make training more unstable. Uh, importantly, we can do, um, we can do planning with much more sophisticated algorithms. So for instance, you can do trajectory optimization in robotics if you have a good model. You can do tree search like in going chess. Um, and so one of the very hardly often mentioned argument is that you use better, you better use your data. Essentially, rather than just using a single scalar reward signal by trying to capture all variety of the environment, you are somehow learning faster by using more information from the environment. So why is model-based learning hard, however? So currently, most uh, model-free algorithms are actually more sample efficient than model-based algorithms and have better asymptotic behavior. Um, so here I'm gonna show you two environment, uh, basically it's the same environment. So uh, it's a very simple, you have a ball that you control with torque. Uh, with red, you're gonna see how does the real environment look like, and with green, it's the prediction of a model. So on the left hand side, we're gonna measure just one step prediction. So at every state, the model is given what's in the environment, predicts the next state, and then project that. Oops, can we? Play the left one. Hope that works. Uh, so as we can see, one-step prediction model is almost indistinguishable from the real environment. Uh, the error is literally very tiny, so things seem to work. Now, okay, so maybe then we've solved model-based RL, but if we try now to start from a state and unroll the environment and the model totally independently of each other, then we get this kind of behavior. 
and like you can see how far off the model is going. Um, and essentially, this is exactly the same model. Um, and then tr if you try to train on this kind of model by just unrolling your model, then essentially the policies that you get are very suboptimal and don't sometimes even work at all in the real environment. Uh, okay, you up. So some of the difficulties of training a dynamics model. So first, not all aspects of the environment might be relevant for any task that you care about. So for instance, if you're a house robot, maybe what's playing on the TV will never be helpful, but that might be very complicated to model. So you might be wasting a lot of capacity of your model on that kind of details. Um, essentially, what I showed earlier is probably one of the biggest issue is that compounding errors lead to very bad predictions in long horizons. Essentially, one of the main issues currently with model-based RL is that if you try to enroll the models for longer horizons, they star start to become so far away from the truth that training on them, as long as it's important for planning that you have long horizon goals, doesn't work. Uh, very hard to estimate uncertainty for flexible models. So this is in general problem with neural networks in machine learning. And usually we want to use neural networks as the dynamics are actually very complicated. Um, and finally, so in terms of the sample efficiency, so auto model based RL might sound like it should be more sample efficient. However, in practice, to learn a very accurate model which you can use to do anything useful, your model will require probably a lot of data. So to some extent here, there's the trade-off that if to get an accurate dynamics model, you require more data than your model-free algorithm requires to learn a policy, then essentially a model-based RL approach will never be more sample efficient than a model-free. And there's sort of uh, kind of gray area of whether it's harder to learn the dynamics or it's very easy to learn the policy and then you don't need a model. Um, so what I'm investigating during my internship and main area of research was to investigate an idea called value expansion and that's mainly for actor critic architectures. Um, so one of the main ideas of value expansion is to kind of try to use the model in order to improve a model free algorithm in terms of its sample efficiency and stability. Uh, so in standard actor critic, we kind of have a action and state coming from the environment and then a next state sample from the environment. And we try to regress our uh, action value function to uh, the target, which is usually bootstrapped. So what value expansion does is after we learn a model uh, denoted in uh, here as T, essentially for every offline uh, data that we have collected, we can use the model to unroll it multiple steps. And uh, this way we can get on policy targets. So we don't need any corrections, uh, for instance, that you'd usually need with important sampling. And we can get multiple step horizon targets uh, using unrolling the model. Now, this, of course, relies that the model still is reasonably accurate to work, uh, but essentially allows us to get a much more stabler targets and much better potentially by having multiple of them. Um, and now I'm going to show you some results and some conclusions from my experience in trying all this in robotics. Um, so the first environments that uh, I evaluated on was the standard fetch tasks. So these are um, essentially environments in a simulator where you have a robot with seven degrees of freedom and it has a gripper. Uh, so one of the environment is just moving the arm to a specific location. Uh, the pick and place is you have to place a block to a specific location. Uh, the push environment, you're pushing a block on a table uh, to a location that changes on every episode. And the slide, which is usually quite difficult, is you have a puck that's on a sliding table and you have to just push it around until it gets to the right place. But there you must be careful that you don't overshoot. Um, so here I'm just putting two plots of some of the work that I've done. Um, there's a lot more, but I don't want to bore you too much. Uh, so essentially the black lines are a baseline uh, deterministic policy gradient algorithm. 
uh, with hint sign experience replay and double Q learning. Uh, and it's specifically optimized to be as sample efficient as possible. So there was a big hyperparameter search that I did. And essentially the red and the blue curves are uh, model-based approaches with value expansion. Um, and as we can see, they outperform the baseline. Uh, in some cases, that's more significant than the others. Uh, but by choosing, uh, so they're a bit fragile to some of the hyperparameters, but essentially all of the final results were achieved with the same hyperparameters across the task. So this showed that this algorithm actually could help and improve at least, uh, so sometimes it's up to five times better sample efficiency. Um, so some takeaway from my experiments, uh, which I think are quite important. So using ensembles for the dynamics model was always necessary. A single model never worked uh, or was never able to be the baseline. And I think this is reoccurring team in the community recently. Uh, so training dynamics models, usually training them on multiple step losses, essentially trying them to make them more consistent as you feed their own predictions into them, also was necessary for improving the baseline. Otherwise, usually the models converge to the same value, but you kind of don't get uh, any improvement in sample efficiency. Uh, also for the value expansion, always if you expand for more than one or two steps, was needed in order to get an actual benefit of the method. Um, and one thing which was quite interesting is that being pessimistic seems to help. Uh, so essentially when you get the multiple horizon targets, rather than taking an average or exponential average like TD Lambda, taking a minimum over the different horizons uh, seems to do better in the harder environments. And this is kind of similar to the double Q learning where uh, essentially you're trying off to kill some of the overestimation bias of your uh, Q function. Um, and I'm gonna skip this because I don't have time. Um, so thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Uh, so the video that I showed was with a model that trains on the dynamics and in both cases it's tra like it's trained on the same environment. The difference is of how you generate the video. So in one you start uh, with a state of the environment, you enroll it once and then you predict the next state and visualize that. However, after that you feed whatever was in the real environment to the model. In the second video that I showed where you get this huge divergence, essentially you start from a state and then you unroll the two things totally independently. So then there the model at every step takes its own predictions from the previous time step and never kind of gets grounded again to the true environment. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, like, I, I can explain that later. So do you mean however this during training or during test time? Uh, during training. So yeah, so one of the points for the multiple step loss was essentially that, however, so you can do a multiple step loss where you feed the prediction of the model into itself multiple times and then you ground it to the real, what you saw in the real world. You can do that however only with deterministic models. Um, and in my experience actually with that kind of uh, loss for longer horizons, I usually needed to use maybe five to eight steps horizon losses. 
the deterministic models did much better than uh, stochastic ones, which, however, those you can train only with a single step loss. <laughs> Model-based approaches were more sample efficient in the cases that you showed, uh, but you also mentioned that sometimes the asymptotic behavior of model-based methods can suffer. Did you also find that, or how, how, how did the asymptotic behavior in performance um, So on basically it was 50-50 pretty much. On uh, two of the environments, the asymp actually on one of the environments, the asymptotic behavior was even slightly better than the baseline. Uh, which probably suggests that the model has learned very accurately the environment and you're gaining something more by having multiple horizon targets. Uh, in the other environments, uh, in two of them, they kind of converge to the same thing. In one of them, the model-based approach actually is a bit worse in asymptotic behavior. Uh, so in general, you can always do the value expansion and also interpolate between the value expansion target and the real world target, which is only one step. Uh, and that, for instance, can uh, alleviate that problem. Okay, yeah. Thanks for the questions.